Well, one day I won three in a row. Yeah. We bought a scramble set when we were... First we were married. First married. And uh, we've still got it today. And it was pretty hard for me because I, I didn't know what those words were you putting out. <laughs> it's um, a little bit the worse for wear. <laughs> but but um, we still have 100 pieces. We've lost one occasionally, but it's always come to light, and we still have a, a 100. So, and we still play it um, quite quite often during the week. Yeah, we didn't pick mangoes this year, so out comes a scrabble. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I think it's a it's a good game. Keep your mind active, and uh, um, and Inga learns new words. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we both we both loved our sport. That was just a part of our life. I'd played cricket uh, all, nearly all my life, and um, after playing the serious cricket, um, I got a phone call requesting if I wanted to play in the Golden Oldies in Brisbane in um, 1988 and of course I jumped at that and uh, that was the start of every second year was a different part of the world. Uh, one year um, Southern Hemisphere, two years later was the Northern Hemisphere. We did Canada um, and then Christchurch uh, and then Birmingham and then Sydney and Cape Town. <laughs> And it just went on um, until 2010 we played our last game in Harrogate with a um, team called the Gladstone Muddies. Our microbe was our emblem and, uh, and we had some wonderful times not only um, just playing cricket but meet it. you're meeting the same, the same players every second year and making friends and uh, it was always a a tour on afterwards, whether it be Europe or Scotland or or back to Denmark. It was a, a great part of our life that uh, we certainly um, look back on very fondly. Christmas Eve was always like dancing around the Christmas tree and everything with live candles back in Denmark. Actually, my dad and my brothers played instruments like in the boys' brigade. So they went up in the local church and played over the, you know, out from the tower. It was lovely. Then we'd get home and have dinner and swap presents. And next day we'd, uh, well, when did we have the snaps then? In Denmark, I don't know. <laughs> Whenever we had a family gathering, I think. But always said that um, have two Christmases here, the Danish Christmas on Christmas Eve and then um, Australian um, Christmas dinner with of course snaps with beer chasers and so it was the best of two worlds really and we still um, we still have our snaps today we only thing is now we've we've got to get it from Melbourne yeah. Uh, there were Russians in the Yawantagini area in the 1940s, um, but the the bulk of the Russians came uh, during the um, 1955 to 1960. In Russia, the uh, Russian Orthodox Church were was banned; they were burnt down, so they uh, had no church. So they they, they were sort of moved out of Russia into a part of China for a while and then the World Council of Churches appealed for countries around the world to take them. And Australia, were, I think, took the bulk of them. There was a, a, a Russian lady in Yarwan that approached the, the farmers in Spring Valley if they would take them on as a share farmer. They produced a, a lot of uh, pawpaws, mostly for the uh, Northgate Cannery in Brisbane, 
Uh, they were very honest people, um, a bit, uh, rather hard to communicate with. So that again. <laughs> but um, when uh, we bought our farm in um, 1963, it had uh, five Russian fair f share farmers on it and an Australian sh share farmer. So we got to know them fairly well through business and they they certainly lived by their instinct. If they thought that something wasn't uh, right, they, they wouldn't agree to it. And then sometimes you had to get an interpreter in to, to tell them uh, what was the right way to go. Being on a farm, of course, you've got to work together. And um, even though we had um, five, six share farmers. We were still in the uh, fruit and vegetable industry ourselves. It was, um, was we were, we loved, uh, you know, putting up a good package of pawpaws and getting top top price and winning first prize in the local show and all this kind of a thing. So um, we um, always worked together. It meant working. Uh, the packing shed was only 20 yards behind our house, so, you know, after tea I would always go out and sort the ripening room or pack some pawpaws. We, we had to have the fruit into the Yarwin railhead by 11 o'clock of the morning. And um, when you've got a, a, a ripening room full of pawpaws to come out to pack, it was some pretty... Crazy. <laughs> You know, we had to get our fruit in the best possible condition to the fresh fruit market. No cold rooms in those days to hold the fruit. It was you, you had to pack it so that by the time we got to the market, it was at the stage where you can eat it. Today, you go to a shop and try to find a pawpaw that you can eat. You can't. They're really all, impossible. They're all green and you've got to have them at home for three days. And if it ripens okay, we well, eat it. And if it doesn't, you throw it out. But in our, in our day, we used to produce pawpaws that looked good, were full of yellow, and, uh, and that's what sold them. Pawpaws was the, the, the first, it took the place of daring in um, Yo and Tuggany district. In the early days, it was uh, timber. Uh, gold mining at Targini and then in 1934 um, uh, fellow Oscar Easy and Paul Lenz introduced uh, a new uh, fruit pawpaws. Nobody knew much about them. Our family started growing them about 1936 and we grew them right through until um, nearly to the year 2000. Um, mangoes they didn't um, come to the uh, Yarwin Targan area until the 80s, early 80s. They weren't uh, recognised as um, a viable fruit then. The shale oil, I, I believe, um, it was the downfall of Yarwin Targan. Uh, when it uh, came there, it seemed to be the the big the big thing. The, Thing that was going to produce uh, because the shale oil field was uh, so big um, that um, yeah, it was a thing of the future. Uh, but when um, they got the pilot plant going to um, extract the uh, oil from the shale, um, some of the farmers were in Targini were having problems because the prevailing wind was taking the uh, the fumes and whatnot over over a certain part of the Targini area, and um, uh, some of them were having respiratory problems, um, no, and just... even <coughs> affecting the uh, the growth of the of the plants, pawpaws and others, and uh, it became a real thorn in the side of the fruit and vegetable growing area of Yarwin and Targini and um, in 1982 I'd done a, an exhibit in the Mount Larkin show with the Yarwin school children something that said um, Yarwin and Targini 
the fruit and vegetable bowl of central Queensland? Will it pay the price of industrial progress? And in 1999, we had no fruit and vegetable uh, growing. We lost our, our cooperative, our railhead. We just lost a lot. So the government had um, bought out the farms in the Targini area. Um, so there was no fruit and vegetable production there and that only left the Spring Valley area with, with half a dozen farmers. We, before that there was 50, 60, 70 farmers in the area so one small valley couldn't support the, the railhead and, and the co-op. So it, it was, and now today you won't find a poor ball grown anywhere in um, Yawin or Targini. Just when you know, when we had the farm with share farmers on, there was, you know, the money was uh, more available, and uh, uh, we used to go to the Brisbane exhibition and look at these beautiful cars, and uh, I tried to talk our local um, agent um, that sold uh, Humber Super Snipes uh, in Gladstone to uh, try to talk him into getting the, the Mercedes dealership but uh, he said it's too expensive to get the t tools and train the men so at the exhibition they, they thought we were just tyre kickers you know because we're only uh, young people we think it was about 27 and I was 28 so yeah, I said, no, they're not fair dinkum, so come down to our workshop down the valley in Brisbane and yeah, have a look at them there. So we did that the next morning and they still weren't interested. And um, as a guy walked into the showroom, he yelled out, oh, hello, we've got the, we've got the Mary Arwen here. And I'm sure the, the salesman thought he'd said the Mirror of Darwin. I think his eyes really popped because out Because all of a sudden head. his attitude changed and we ended up driving out with a brand new Mercedes Benz <laughs> worth $7,000 then. Well, $7,000 was, it, you know, you could buy two and a half Fords or two Holdens and uh, that kind of thing. Sixty years of marriage. Our daughter, I think she went and saw um, Glenn Butcher. Glenn Butcher. He sent the letter and then it just started. The Queen sent one. I yeah, guess. I think, you know. Everybody. Everybody like, has turned 100 or 60 years old. Unbelievable. Away. Yeah, we believe in saving things. We don't throw a lot of things out because you never know when you might need it. <laughs>